to you guys. Okay, the thing you can hear me. All right, and me too. As long no. as this works. Okay. Good morning. Um, I like to kind of warn the audience. We did this for Military Officers Association a few weeks ago, and we nailed it right at 50 minutes. But we've uh, added some material, so uh, just so you know, we don't go on on and on and on. I also tend to lose my voice, so about halfway through I have a 16-minute pre-recorded section, and as Bob knows, that comes up when uh, you see John Wayne, and he's in a flight helmet, and he's holding a microphone. We, set, we have to set the level into another speaker, just otherwise saves you the annoyance and me the embarrassment of coughing and hacking and running for the throat spray. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's really a special privilege to be the speakers on Memorial Day weekend, and we're very grateful for that. We're talking today about the China-Burma-India theater of World War II, and well, now I get to see if this works. Um, so I want to do a couple recognitions of, uh, of Himalayan hump um, heroes. And now we'll see if this, it works. Very recently, uh, two boxes were brought to the museum. And this is uh, rather incredible and magical to me. And uh, we were privileged to be able to dig through them with uh, Mr. Whitlock. And they turn out to be these amazing, priceless, historic artifacts of William Harris. They were discovered in an abandoned storage locker in Denver. Now, we have not located the family of William Harris. I want to give a special thanks to Bear Owen and his associate, uh, Kyle Strunk. We're working on it, um, trying to find sons, daughters, grandkids to reunite them with these artifacts. But this is the exhibit upstairs. Please be sure you see that. It's in the upstairs front gallery, exhibit on the hump. And that is William L. L. Harris, and he flew C-46s on the hump. No, can we turn that off? Well, so we can see you. Oh, you don't need to see me. I, I want to see. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to give recognition to uh, Olindo Giraro. This is a full-page article the Broomfield Enterprise did in 2007. And as a result of this, I met Olindo and his wife, Elsie. They came to my home. They advised me on the first edition of my book 12 or 13 years ago. Olindo flew... 130 missions across the hump as a navigator radio operator. I have pulled out one little segment of this. Uh, he crashed in a B-24 and a barrel exploded and uh, he says fire came right over my face. I put my hands in the fuselage to get out and the skin came right off. Um, so I, I point that out because uh, you're going to hear a story about my father having a almost a similar incident with a, a 55 gallon barrel of gasoline flying the hump. Uh, so we have Orlando's daughter with us today, uh, Jenny Stone. S pronounce that for me. Stonier. Stonier. Would you please just say hi to the group? And we're so happy to have you today. Um, and then uh, there's Captain Robert Erickson, and also we know not enough about Robert Erickson. He flew the hump in C-47s, and uh, not sure how many trips. He survived the most rugged terrain on Earth, and then uh, took a job with a small airline in California, and uh, crashed into a mountain tragically. There were a couple other, three other veterans on board. And that was 1951. His son was four years old at the time. So we're wanting to know much more about uh, Captain Erickson. And we have the four-year-old here with us, Robert Jr. <laughs> and so that's a, a real privilege. Now, with you guys, uh, I, I think of an ancient historical text. I just have to mention it. It's, uh, it goes into ten uh, principles for living a successful life. Number four, number five is honor your father and mother. So uh, you're going to hear in a minute uh, Alex say that our purpose today goes far beyond history and nostalgia. Um, and so that ancient text kind of ties into that. If you thoroughly read the text, 
It says, honor your father and mother so that you might live long in the land in which you have been given. So the reason we honor our parents, the reason we honor our heroic veterans, many of whom are in this room, uh, is that we might live long in the land that we have been given. Thank you, Fred. Okay. It's an honor to share these narratives with you as we read excerpts from our books. We live in perilous and frightening times. I can hear the voice of my own father saying something about repeated history. Not since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 has the entire world faced this level of nuclear conflict. As Fred mentioned, our purpose today goes far beyond history and nostalgia. It is in this time of global challenge, we need to hear the valiant stories of the men and women who lived through that period of history. We need inspiration from our greatest heroes. We need their courage. The historian David McCullough wrote, history is a guide to navigation in perilous times. Americans, as I said, are living in dangerously divided times. World War II united our nation in an American spirit and consensus that saved the world from an overwhelming fascist threat and went on to build the greatest economic and technologic expansion ever seen in history. We then also must explore that lesson of history. Our children deserve to know these stories and your stories because what their forebears did echoes down to the future they inhabit and made the lives they enjoy in America today possible. They should know. They inherited the same heart as their heroic predecessors. It is a courageous heart capable of greatness that we discover in our stories of a warrior's journeys. Fred and I are available to help compile your own stories. Give us a call. In World War II, the India-China airlift or Himalayan hump operation was the highest loss, highest risk air transport mission of the war. Pioneering aviators carried thousands of tons of gasoline and materiel across the highest terrain on Earth to supply B-29 bases deep in the interior of China that were poised for early bombing missions on Japan. Flight operations had never been attempted over the planet's highest and most rugged mountains, much less on a year-round, all-weather basis. Winds were measured at over 250 miles per hour, and downdrafts were encountered of over 3,000 feet per minute. Add to that the intensely hazardous payload of thousands of gallons of gasoline carried on these flights. The cost was the deaths of over 1,300 aircrew and more than 600 aircraft lost. General Claire Chenault, the region's air commander, said that only men of special caliber could live up to the demands of the hump. They were the swashbuckling pilots of the India-China wing. Fred and I met last year after we found out that we had both written books about our dads flying the hump. Remarkably, both men flew the same type aircraft, the C-87, a, not a notoriously quirky aircraft. Both were at the same remote airbase in Assam, India. Both were stationed there at the same time. And both men contracted multiple sclerosis after the war, which is an important aspect of our research and story because new medical studies point to a viral cause of MS among veterans. Peter Dominic flew 67 missions across the Himalayas in C-87 transports and later served in the Air Transport Command throughout the world. Returning from the war to settle in Colorado, he became one of the first partners in Colorado's largest law firm, Holland and Hart. In 1956, he was elected to the State House after being urged to get into politics by none other than Dwight Eisenhower. In 1960, he was elected to the U.S. Congress and in 1962 to the U.S. Senate. In 1975, he was ambassador to Switzerland. Frank Martin flew 66 missions over the hump in the same aircraft type following his prior duties delivering B-17 bombers to the 8th Air Force in Europe in pioneering flights over the North Atlantic. That's another story that Fred tells in his book. 
He returned from the war to join the Cessna Aircraft Company and became Vice President of Marketing. In 2012, he was inducted into the Kansas Governor's Aviation Hall of Fame. My father died in 1981 from a massive heart attack. He was 65. I was 27. I was alone with him in the house, and I was upset with him for not accepting my invitation to read some of my poems. I had hoped to get him to open up to me to talk about feelings, and he turned me down flat. Of course. The next day, while I was in the room next to his bedroom, he died without making a sound. In 1982, as my family sorted through his belongings, we discovered a very small notebook about three inches by five inches. When we opened it, we discovered that it was a diary written in pencil about my dad's time as a pilot flying the hump. No one, not even my mother, knew it existed. Unfortunately, here's what it said. June 17th continued. That meant somewhere there was a first half. It was a daily accounting of his time as a pilot, a lawyer defending servicemen against charges brought for various infractions of military or civilian law, and an instructor for newly arriving hump pilots. Although we turned the house upside down, we couldn't find the first part. Fast forward to 2014 and the sale of our family home. My mother was 93 and needed to go to assisted living. As we packed the storage, storage boxes, a miracle happened. And the first part of the diary appeared, not much bigger than the other one, and also in pencil. Combined, the story tells his, of his daily life in India from January to December of 1944. I combined the two sections and published Flying the Hump, the War Diary of Peter H. Dominic in 2018. And then another miracle occurred. As I spent time with Dad's manuscript, I began to experience a different kind of relationship with him. I began to understand how he came to feel he had something to contribute besides his military duty. I learned why he felt so strongly about America. Here's one excerpt from the diary. There is nothing like the philanthropy of America. We fight to save India for the British, which we do without charge, and we pay them for bases to fight from, build them ourselves after renting the land, pay a 20% royalty to the, British, to the British government on all people we hire to help us, and after we're through with the bases and have them in A1 condition, we give them back. In China, where the 14th Air Force is the only available fighting group, we pay the Chinese for the use of these bases and give them equipment and even outfit the warlords, most of whom are fighting against us. In Burma, we do the same thing. In France, there are five American armies and one British, made up of Canadians, Aussies, and New Zealanders. There's more. He wrote, I remarked the other day that I didn't feel I had been worth $360 a month from the government, and that at times I was embarrassed to take it. Wages are supposedly paid for hard work, responsibility, and ideas. In this game, flying is mostly fun. The danger certainly doesn't compare to that of a private in the Marines attacking Tarawa. I pray to heaven that the young people don't lose their perspective or their senses of humor. If they think that after this war the world owes them a living, they're going to get an awful kick in the pants. And I hope I'm there to help kick. My two brothers were born while Dad was in the Army. I was born well after, in December of 1953, so my sister Lynn, born in 1949, and I had a very different childhood experience from them. They had the great outdoors, Colorado style. Lynn and I had Washington, D.C. in politics. That did have its advantages over the years, but it sure was not the same family environment. Dad worked incredibly hard in a difficult environment. It was the Camelot years and the Democrats held both legislative houses. It was also the 60s, and the country was in turmoil. He just didn't have the energy to fully engage with a, quote, second batch of kids. Having had twins myself in my late 30s, I get it. Many of my Washington friends with high-powered parents reported the same lack of engagement from them. I just couldn't seem to get what I wanted from our relationship, so we never really connected in what I thought was a meaningful way. I became a re rebellious teenager. Remember the 60s? <laughs> 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 
and further damaged our relationship. Years later, though, reading his words, feeling how strong a character he was, how competent in any cockpit, how passionate he was about America's role in the world, and how very much he loved my mother, helped me to understand him, appreciate him, and love him in a way that was new. I'll always be grateful for that. <laughs> my book project began when I was a young man fishing with my father on a remote Canadian lake. Dad never told many war stories, but that day, between hooking walleyes, he spontaneously began telling me of aerial gasoline tanker crashes at his World War II base in India. He was suddenly recalling in obvious anguish how he had to watch helplessly as friends perish before his eyes, the flailing of those men's bodies as they were consumed by the flames and the pouring black smoke, and how they slumped over, still buckled in their seats as the cockpit exploded and he was powerless to rescue them. I was stunned and turned away to the tackle box in silence. But then I turned back from the fishing gear and I awkwardly promised him that one day I would write his biography. Seven years after his passing, remembering my promise, I dug into a scrapbook. Yet the clippings in those shoe boxes were entirely from his post-war years with the Cessna Aircraft Company. I have told that story in another book, Reminiscences Over Old Airplanes, but his autobiographical notes offered little about World War II. What he wrote about all his World War II experiences, everything I write about in my book and tell here, was a total of six sentences. So this story would have been lost except for my mother. In World War II, she had been secretary to the base commander, Newcastle Army Air, Air Base, Delaware, from where dad flew B-17s to Europe. After the war, she had her own illustrious career in the federal government, becoming secretary to the director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. But years later, we had to move to an Alzheimer's care facility. I cleaned out her house, discovering her most secret possessions. Deep in a lower drawer were binders of 211 letters my father had written to her during his nine months in India. Nearly a letter each day, hand penned from a jungle hut or from a freezing cockpit high above the most remote mountain reaches of the earth. She had never revealed that she had those letters. My parents divorced when I was six, so here was the treasure of a secret window on their war-parted love affair. The letters correlated to the pilot logbooks, allowing me to assemble the details of these quite incredible flights and of daily life in India. And Dad had taken many photos that you will see in this slideshow. There were old cigar boxes of curled and crumbling black and white photographs, along with a brown case of carefully labeled color Kodachrome slides. In their original deteriorating condition, they had never much caught the family's eye. But after electronic restoration, what emerged on the computer screen was startling. These were subjects of historic proportion. I had discovered another treasure that brought the letters from India vividly alive. So why was crossing the Himalayas so important in World War II? After Pearl Harbor, the Japanese sealed off eastern China from the Pacific and exploded across the Pacific at incredible speed. They seized and fortified the Marianas and other island chains so that airlied, Allied air retaliation was not in range of Japan from the Pacific. They overran the Philippines, capturing MacArthur's Allied troops. MacArthur vowed to return. They moved into Indochina, Thailand, down the Malay Peninsula to overwhelm British Singapore, and they took the Dutch East Indies. Australia was threatened. The Axis powers now held over one-third of the planet. American commanders wanted bomber bases in China that with Pacific islands under Japanese control could only be supplied from eastern India. By the end of that grim December 1941, Japan was poised to move next on India. If they cut off access to the Burma Road from Rangoon, the Allies could not supply China. Then Japan brutally attacked British Burma. Here was a place so remote, most Americans only had a cloudy notion of, this far, of its faraway existence as a place of mythical legend in storybooks. Our dads had cast themselves on the winds of war, 
by joining the Air Transport Command. Those winds had already stirred up into the storm they would be drawn into when on Christmas Eve 1941, the Japanese laid siege on Rangoon. So now class, uh, here's a test question. How, how long did it take the Japanese to go from Pearl Harbor to Rangoon in their attempt to utterly isolate China? The answer is two weeks. With the Burma Road cut off, an attempt was made to build a new road, the Lido Road connecting out the Assam Valley to the Burma Road in the north. Winston Churchill called it an immense laborious task, unlikely to be completed until the need for it has passed. The need was for massive shipments of supplies for Allied air bases in China and gasoline to fuel B-29s attacking Japan from deep inside the Chinese interior. 20,000 engineers and 35,000 natives labored for two years to open the Lido Road from India to China. When finally completed, truck caravans took over a month to cross the 800 miles to China over grades up to 17 percent and under continuous Japanese air attacks. Churchill was nearly correct. The road was completed less than a year from the war's end. So for the enormous requirements of the China base operations, it became clear that ground transport on the Lido Road was not practical. The transport problem would be solved by airlift over the highest terrain on Earth. The hump operation completed the longest material supply line in the world. After the 12,000 mile ocean voyage from the U.S. to Karachi or Bombay, shipments traveled 1,500 miles on India's dilapidated rail lines. Then every bean and bullet, as one commander put it, had to be flown from bases in Assam over into China. General Chenault estimated that for every ton of bombs delivered to Japan, 18 tons of materiel had to be flown over the hump. They flew over regions of the earth never before seen by human eyes. These were pioneering aviation routes. Minyakonka is the highest peak in eastern Sichuan. It was thought to be higher than Everest. No one knew. This is a one-inch Kodachrome slide taken by my dad from the pilot seat. It's my favorite picture in the collection. Note the monsoon flow piling up against the mountains. The Brahmaputra River, flowing down from the great Himalayan ranges of Tibet and China and the foothills of Burma, flows through the Assam province at the eastern extremity of India. On the banks of that river, amidst tea plantations and rice paddies carved from flowering jungles that are known for a rare species of black tigers that lives there, sits the city of Tezpur. It is a name from an ancient Hindu warrior legend that means city of blood. There, the army had built one of a series of air bases situated along the river, positioned for missions over the high mountains to China. The air route over the hump rose out of the river valley to the northeast over the 10,000-foot Naga Hills, named for the headhunting tribe that lived there, then crossed the gorges of the Irrawaddy, Salween, and Mekong rivers, and up to the backbone of the hump, the Sansung ranges of eastern Sichuan and Tibet. Pilots referred to the route as the Aluminum Trail because of the number of airplanes lost along it. So I'd like to read just a few entries from my father's diary. March 30th, got a trip to Chengdu. Weather was horrible. Flew two and a half hours on instrument by DR, or dead reckoning, and hit the checkpoint right on the nose. We had a snowstorm, ice, rain, and strong winds. We even had snow in the cockpit. Came back on instruments and got St. Elmo's fire all over the plane. Flew through two thunderstorms from necessity, not choice. <laughs> and then had trouble finding the field as our radio compass needles were thrown off by electrical storms and the field was socked in. Really rough trip and a, f and a forerunner of monsoon weather. March 18th. Coming back in the early hours this morning, we ran into a storm and then had the biggest display of St. Elmo's fire I've ever experienced. The props had a perfect halo around them, the pitot tubes were green arrows in the night, and it played all over the windows like ghastly luminous fingers trying to get in. June 11th, all went well till we were over Tali when the controls tightened up. 
Next, the plane did its best to turn over four times. Schnitz and I were both using full controls, throttle wide open, and stick full forward. 60 degrees from one side to the other it lurched, and then slowly straightened out. We had lost 2,800 feet and only had 14,800 left. Tali is at 15,200. Luckily, we were slightly south of it. In all my flying, I've never had anything remotely resembling it or quite as dangerous, as the maneuvers were so violent there wasn't a chance of getting out of the ship. July 14th. Heller's ship threw into a thundercloud, which was so rough it spilled their gyro instruments. They tried to fly it on needle and ball, but they were already on spiral and couldn't get it out. Heller yelled to bail out, and Cariotti got up to do so. He lost consciousness before bailing out and came to falling through the air. He pulled his ripcord and landed okay. Apparently, the ship, which was in this tight spiral and had an indicated airspeed of 300 miles per hour, had hit an air pocket and torn a wing off the plane. The center section of the wing is over the flight deck, and apparently Cariotti was sucked out. He didn't have his chute buckled up and was hanging by one arm when he came to. No word on any of the other crew members. August 3rd, a bad one. Usual storms, but hit hail squalls that dented the leading edges of the wings, and lightning hit us twice and knocked out the radio. Had another fire at the end of another trip. If anything gets me, it will be fire in the air, I'm sure. September 13th. Everything went fine till we got 40 minutes past the first ridge. Number one engine manifold pressure and tachometer started dancing around, the, and the engine ran away. I tried to feather the engine and turn it around, but it would not feather. I cut mixture, turbo, booster pump, throttle, ignition, and gas pump, and I kept it at 2,500 RPM. Then number two engine started to do the same. Feathered it, but by that time we were down to 15,800 feet and dropping. Sent the crew chief back to dump the load and get the radio man to send a distress signal. It was obvious that with only two engines, we'd have to bail out, so we unfeathered number two and managed to get it running. It stayed okay till near the end. Then the crew chief came back to tell me that the lurch I'd just felt was caused by having the rear door go through the tail surface while falling off. <laughs> we had full trim and both of us on the rudder to hold it even. We were rapidly losing altitude, and it looked like we wouldn't even be able to get back over the, over the Naga Hills. I gave the word to prepare to bail out and then notified all stations of our position. Then I thought of a fighter strip fairly close to us and I headed for that. Number one prop was flat side to the breeze and caught fire. Pulled the fire extinguisher. We were down to 8,000 feet and still losing altitude with 47 inches of manifold pressure on the other three engines. We were close to the fighter strip but couldn't see it when they turned their homing off. Managed to radio them to get it back on. Found the field nestled in a cup of hills going up to 10,000 feet. We had 5,000 and were holding. I started making a right-hand pattern and lost the field. Made a left-hand pattern. Engine one on fire again. On the downwind leg, I found we couldn't get far enough away from the field to make the pattern. Lost all flight instruments and number two engine edged into the hills over the trees, took one last look, cut power, and made a 45 degree banking 180 degree approach, dropping flaps and gear at the same time. Luckily, they came down. <laughs> Aimed just short of the runway and plowed through sand on final. Approach was just right, but when I started flare out, the four drums in the nose wouldn't come up stood up and yanked on the elevators. It eased over a ditch and lit on end, and we stopped two-thirds of the way up a 4,000-foot runway. OK, here's John Wayne. Do you need a, a switch? See, I, I wouldn't get through this narrative successfully. Flight accounts, though longer than 
Alex's detailed experiences shared by both our fathers and other hump crews at the test probe base. In our books, we provide some technical review of the C-87 our dads flew. Ernest Gaughan, in his book, Fate is the Hunter, is one of my favorite aviation writers and a great source on the C-87. He hated the airplane, going on a length, deriding the C-87, and almost killed him numerous times. He remarked, they could not carry enough ice to chill a highball. The C-87 had been hastily derived from the B-24 platform. There were many problems with the airplane. Gaughan wrote, they were an evil bastard contraption, nothing like the relatively efficient B-24, except in appearance. The assembly of parts, known collectively as a C-87, would never replace an airplane. Another B-24 derivative our dads flew over the hump was the C-109, which had built-in fuel tanks. C-109s burned twice as much fuel getting there as they delivered. Early in 1944, the commander of operations issued a directive that no flights were to be canceled or delayed because of weather. This order was widely referred to as the there will no longer be weather decree, and pilots quit that the weather could be thus ordered away. Perhaps a similar order could be issued to the Japs. Weather had closed the route to China half the time. At the test port base, aircraft were crashing regularly on takeoff and horrific fireballs. Flights were frequently lost en route to Japanese attackers and for reasons unknown. In early June, the ship of the chief pilot was reported missing, then another colleague crashed. Dad wrote, he's in the hospital with broken bones. Some of his crew were not so fortunate. Our safety record here has just gone flop the last few days. Two crews lost, one definitely all killed, the other missing. Haney's still in the hospital in China. Bill Shaughnessy is okay except for missing most of his teeth. Sure wish the enemy would just fold up, but I can't see it for a mighty long time. To listen to Jap broadcasts from Shanghai, you would think that they are going to win. It should be noted that Alex gained permission of Clayton Cools of MIARecoveries.org. They conduct expeditions into the high mountains to locate wreckages that pump in military aircraft. They have found 27 missing aircraft and 279 personnel, some listed for decades as missing in action. Air bases on both sides of the home were built employing native labor. Entire families worked on India bases, while in China, rock crushers, mostly women, broke gravel using hammers, then carried it to the airstrip in baskets on their heads. Up to 100,000 coolies worked on each China base. Construction equipment was scarce, ox carts were used to haul rock, Hand-drawn rollers pulled by 100 coolies or more flat in the field. The result was a bumpy airfield about 6,000 feet in length. Dad's August 14 trip was typical. A 10 and a half hour round robin to Chen Tu, back over to Su Karateen and down the test port. Then he was called out at 4 a.m. for another flight, a 7 hour, 40 minute round trip back to Chen Tu. Dad still wrote to mother that night. Now it's after 10 and I just got through talking to Buddy and other guests I am so tired and dopey that I really don't know what I'm doing half the time. It sure gets dark out over that thousand miles of stone at night. That is, until we hit the roughest weather yet last night and the storms lit things up like day. We were barely getting over the top of the thunder clouds and when we broke clear, we were flying among stars above the storm. And that's the passage that gave the title for my book. A few days later, he wrote, I need a good cry tonight, but just can't. One of our finest friends, one of the best fellows I've met, was killed last night. His ship crashed and burned right after takeoff. On takeoff in a loaded tanker, the airplane is sluggish, barely airborne, balanced on a tight wire of airspeed, wherein single mile per hour increments make all the difference between a climb beyond hill or trees or mushing back to the ground. A backfiring engine, a downdraft, a payload slightly off center of gravity, a momentary lapse in concentration. These were only some of the factors that could bring down the airplane in its 6,000 gallon load of gasoline. The India-China airlift was a non-combat operation and that imparted an added sense of tragedy to the frequent crashes. If an airline or any transport operation suffered such multiple crashes each week with many right at the airport, then what pilot would continue flying and what passenger or crew member would ever board the aircraft? Now, please let me read to you some flight accounts to give you a sense of the unrelenting pace of operations. 
On the 3rd of September, there had been a 10 and a half hour trip to and from Chengdu. The next day, the flight was 9 hours, 45 minutes to and from Penchang. The next day, 11 hours to Quang Han, then Quang Han again on both the next two days. There was no time to worry over the deaths of other pilots. The most eminent enemy was crushing fatigue. Just one of these trips over the hump was a flight of expeditionary proportion at this time in aviation history. Two days later, Dad flew his 40th trip over the hump to Penchang. Next day, he flew flight number 41 back to Penchang and Sukaratine. The next day, 10 and a half hours to Quang Han, then another round trip to Quang Han on the same day. That was an unimaginable 22 hours of flying the Himalayas in one 24 hour period after one night off in 10 consecutive days of such flights. After a flight to Quang Han, Dad wrote Mother, did you hear? We bombed Japan yesterday. It was B-29s from our theater. This is what the massive effort was all about, pulling all this gasoline over the mountains. He went on, I can't answer your question about where the B-29s are. It's secret. No one but the Japs and a couple million other people know where they're based. But they sure are big though. He had no idea at that moment that he would be a B-29 commander in 10 months. These B-29 missions through Quang Han defy belief. Flying from Calcutta over the hump, they landed in Quang Han to refuel and load ordnance. Then, the incredible round trip to bomb Japan, back to refueling Quang Han, and then return to Calcutta where the bombers were safer from Japanese attack. Allow me a digression. I lost a friend last year, Margaret Schmidt, a Denver psychotherapist. Her specialty was PTSD. Her father, Captain William Wellinger, flew these missions in his B-29, which he named Journey for Margaret. I'm still working with Marty's sister and niece to discover more about the flights of Journey for Margaret. Captain Wellinger flew Journey in a B-29 squadron low flyover of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay as the surrender was being signed. Nearly 2,000 American aircraft participated that day, along with U.S. warships clogging Tokyo Bay. Just imagine that spectacle as a painful reminder to those Japanese officers that uh, this is no time to second guess your absolute surrender. I have to digress again and go back a year in Dad's logbook. As Alex and I shared our remarkable confluence of heritage with our fathers, we compared their logbooks and discovered that our dads had flown a check ride together. Dad mentions this in a letter to mother. Now imagine two men fly a proficiency check flight in India in 1944. 77 years later, their sons meet by pure chance in Colorado in 2021 and are now here to tell their stories. Back to the next day after that 22 hours of flying, Dad wrote mother a letter. Dearest Sally, had a long trip yesterday and didn't get to bed until 2 a.m. today. Flew 35 Chinese back to India last night and landed them at another base, so it was late getting home. These were Chinese nationalist soldiers under Chiang Kai-shek. Most had no boots, only straw sandals. The bedding issued to some units was one blanket per five soldiers, and pay was so low even officers could not afford any more than rice. They were plagued by dysentery, smallpox, and typhus to such a degree that some units had 40% losses without entering combat. Dad wrote of his passengers that night, you have never smelt a real odor. Because of censoring, what Dad cannot mention in this letter is that one or more of these Chinese soldiers had died in his airplane. It had been a six-hour flight over the mountains with no oxygen at sub-zero temperature. Years later, that day while fishing together, Dad wondered if the families of the dead ever found out what had happened to them, or if the soldiers who had survived the flight had ever found their way back home across the Himalayas. My dad actually took very few photos of flight operations, and he mostly wrote about his growing fondness for the people of Assam. He became close to one family in particular and spoke of the most peaceful family life and the most beautiful children in the world. He wrote, 
They gave me coconuts and pineapples. If I had taken it, I would have had enough food for a week, and they didn't have enough for themselves. He wrote often about his bearer, our house servant, Abdul. When Mother sent Abdul a gold watch from the States, he ran outside so as not to be seen crying. He thought my mother looked beautiful and plenty healthy, but he wondered why she never came to visit. Dad bought a Victrola record player from a departing pilot, and Abdul took command of it, playing his favorites, which were opera. When his tour ended, Dad gave Abdul a month's pay and the gold penny he had written all the letters with. Abdul ran from the Basha to not be seen crying. Dad's roommate was the base chaplain he called the preacher. Dad wrote mother, he keeps the drinking and the women parties down. The, the preacher much enjoyed that dad would pack bottles of beer in the bulkheads of his airplane that would freeze over the mountain so he could serve ice cold beer back in the hot jungle. The preacher stowed away on flights to China and dad gave him flying lessons over the Himalayas. Dad wrote, he was like a little kid at the controls on the adventure of his life. Dad visited families in China, went to a remote place, and the women still bind their feet, and they're no larger than their hands. Is this the 20th century? His photo of this woman at the spinning wheel is another of my favorites. It was becoming cold in China and still swelteringly hot in test court. Both our dads were becoming chronically ill with the cold and fever and were visiting the infirmary regularly. Yet, even after very long flights, he always escaped to visit his Indian family. We will come back to this chronic flu in a few minutes. On October 7th, they took off toward China, heading into the mountains they encountered turbulence so severe that a man's head would be smashed on the ceiling of the cockpit if not for the shoulder harnesses holding them to their seats. A barrel burst and 55 gallons of gasoline spilled out on the deck. This is the era of many arcing electric relays and red glowing vacuum tube radios. Sam began frantically tugging on his harness releases, wanting to get up and get his chute on. He preferred bailing out in a thunderstorm over the Himalayas to dying in a fireball. Releasing the shoulder harness would have been enough to kill him. Eventually, they broke out in the clear and set a return course for test port. They shut down all the electrics they could and planned their landing of the heavily loaded freighter. The landing gear could be cranked down by hand, but they were going to have to use the electric landing flaps to stop the airplane on the jungle strip, and there would likely be a small electric arc when they hit the switch. Dad winced as he reached for the flap switch. He hesitated and then lowered the flaps. He wrote Mother, there was no reason the aircraft didn't explode. Dad's log entry for this flight has a rather understated notation, who returned with leaky gas drum. The next flight was 11 and a half hours back and forth to Chengdu. There was a day off, then seven hours round trip back to Chengdu. Next, 11 hours, 45 minutes to Cheng Kang and back to Tezpur. The next day, a 12 hour plus round robin to Luliang, Chengdu, and Tezpur. The next day, Chengdu again. Two nights later, Dad was supposed to fly to China, but another ship crashed on the field and he went to the hospital. There were five aboard, he wrote Mother. All real badly hurt. I gave a transfusion to the pilot, so I can't fly again for another day. He died a few minutes later, which doesn't speak too well for my blood, but he was so badly mangled and broken, and it's a miracle he lived even a minute. Another one is being operated on for multiple skull fractures, and chances aren't too good. But the doctors have pretty high hopes for the other three. Somehow this crash doesn't bother me a bit, but the last one I told you about had me pretty upset. Several ships have just disappeared in routes, the Japs have gotten a couple, and with all the crashes going on, you get so that it's just another one. The next night, Dad mailed his letter and went out for another flight. He had a new co-pilot he had known on the North Atlantic runs. It was the fellow's first trip over the hump. It was foggy that night. Visibility was obscured as they held short in the rumbling tanker waiting for clearance. Dad took the runway and accelerated. Halfway down, another tanker came looming out of the dark fog head on. The other pilot was taxiing and he kicked his rudder pedal hard and turned his ship off the runway into a ditch that ran alongside. That ship's nose wheel dropped in the ditch and the big double rudders cantilevered up in front of Dad's accelerating airplane. There was no time to react and no space to maneuver in. His ship had not reached liftoff speed, but Dad pulled back hard on the control column and the gasoline-laden C-109 wavered off the ground. With one of the main landing gears striking a rudder on the other aircraft, Dad's ship yawed wildly, but somehow remained in flight and clawed out over the trees. 
After gaining a stable flight attitude, they had to make a decision. The landing gear must have been bent or broken, they reasoned. Surely the tire must have been blown out. The co-pilot went back to look out a window. He tried to assess damage with a flashlight. Nothing was apparent, but it was impossible to know. Should they return for landing and test for overloaded with gasoline, or try retracting the gear and burn off their wing tanks flying to China, where they might not be able to lower the gear, but would be lighter for landing? Their duty was to deliver the fuel to China. They retracted the gear and had a very anxious flight to Quang Han. The landing there was without incident. A hearing was later convened on this runway accident. The fuel controller that night charged that Dad had taken the runway without a clearance. Dad's testimony was simply honest. I was so tired and sleepy, I really can't tell you if I had a clearance or not. Two other pilots listening on the fuel frequency that night testified they had heard the clearance. The hearing was closed. The next night, after this harrowing flight, Dad went to relax at the outdoor movie before his next departure scheduled for the early morning. The movie was Shine On Harvest Moon, but it was cut short and there was an explosion in the sky lit up like day. Another tanker had crashed a mile after takeoff, not as fortunate as Dad had been the night before. It, it all seemed so insane and useless to me, he wrote Mother. It, it isn't the hump that's dangerous, but the rushing and assigning of unqualified personnel. He returned to his basha late that night from the crash scene. The chaplain and several others were on the porch, conversing in low tones. They gave him more bad news. The young pilot who lived next door was missing. They found the wreckage in China the next morning. He wrote, four more dead, all of them. Penny wise and how foolish the way the army does things and it sure makes you sick. We have a cute little puppy now named Ding Hao. The young man who was killed last night brought her back from China and raised her on an eye dropper. Now that he's gone, she seems to have adopted us. By early December, another crew was lost and pilots were refusing to fly. He wrote, there are several who were afraid to fly the hump and some of them we used to think of as rocks. One captain was court-martialed when he refused and got a dishonorable discharge. We lost a ship the other day, or I should say another one, and everyone is jittery. I don't enjoy this, but the scariest part for me is working with crew members who are afraid. You never know what to expect from them. In late December, just before Dad's last flight over the hump, Tokyo Rose, the Japanese radio propagandist, said in her broadcast that pilots crossing the hump would die and never return. Dad wrote Mother about what Rose had said and he remarked, now you better start worrying about me. His 66th and last trip over the hump was flown amid a flurry of enemy alerts on the day after Christmas, 1944. On that flight, they had to circle Chung Kong for four hours, waiting for a Japanese attack on that base to end before finally receiving landing clearance. Back in Tezpur, as he taxied in and shut down the empty C-109 for the last time, I imagine that he walked away with very little regret. So, by reading all these repetitive flight narratives, I, I wanted to give you a feel for the incredible daily stress and trauma on these crews. Along with many hump pilots and crew, our dads were awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and Air Medal. The Distinguished Flying Cross was created by an act of Congress in 1926 and is America's oldest military aviation award. The DFC is awarded to aviators and aircrew for heroism and or extraordinary achievement during aerial flight and is the only medal conferred by all five military services in peacetime and in all wars and campaigns since World War I. We have Gary Sinise here. I don't know if he will play. He should play. What do you mean? Gary Sinise is about to say something. Oh, okay. Is he? I think so. Distinguished Flying Cross has yeah. been awarded to such notables as Charles Lindbergh, yeah. Amelia Earhart, President George H. W. Bush, Tuskegee Airman General. No, you're good. Oh, yeah. 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 We hit the queue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Military aviators have always captured a special place in the hearts and minds of Americans. Only the best and most courageous are awarded a distinguished fighting cross. 
The Distinguished Flying Cross has been awarded to such notables as Charles Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, President George H.W. Bush, Tuskegee Airman General Benjamin O. Davis, General Jimmy Doolin, actor James Stewart, and numerous astronauts including John Glenn and James Lowe. Do we have any DFC recipients in the group? Here's one. Here's one. By the end of December 1944, both men's flying duties were over, but the war continued. The war news was disheartening. The Japanese were still advancing in China. MacArthur had been returned to the Philippines after terrible battle losses, yet a long siege of Japan was anticipated with fears of American casualties in an invasion of up to half a million soldiers. In Europe, the Battle of the Bulge was underway as Germany attempted its last vicious defense. There are many important postscripts to these letters and stories. Warriors suffer many losses from the battles long after the war is over. As mentioned, both our dads contracted multiple sclerosis years after the war. Fred's dad thought that the cause of his multiple sclerosis was his long exposure to carbon monoxide and fuel fumes in old airplanes. The Mayo Clinic had suggested that. My dad's doctors thought perhaps he'd gotten some kind of a virus on a trip to Mexico when he was 19. Yet, more recent research has also theorized a viral cause of neurogenerative diseases and suggests that a cold virus originating on the Indian subcontinent might be a common cause of both MS and Alzheimer's. We want to bring this issue out in our talks and books if other families are wondering about such a disease cause. With a viral causation, perhaps there is a hope for a vaccine in the future. This has caused us to consider a possible implication of our dad's chronic viral illnesses over those months in India. Viral epidemics had been associated with both MS and Alzheimer's in those regions. Once the virus infects, it may lay dormant for many years and then find a venereal transmission pathway. After long years of caring for both my parents' conditions, in 1994, my mother died of Alzheimer's disease as I held her in my arms. So I now wonder, in light of this research, were she, my dad, and Alex's dad the final casualties of World War II in this story? Dominic's MS caught up to him in 1975 when he was serving as U.S. Ambassador to Switzerland. The main benefit of writing my book and what made it all worthwhile is that it became an application submission along with my second book that got dad inducted into the Kansas Governor's Aviation Hall of Fame. Over 350 Kansas aviation folk were there that night. His picture now hangs next to Walter Beach, Clyde Cessna, Bill Lear, Amelia Earhart, and other Kansas aviation luminaries. When I was young and both my parents were vibrantly alive, I did not know enough to ask for old war stories. The letters written to my mother from dad in India are a treasure I did not discover until she was moved to a nursing home in the 1990s. She had kept them to herself deep in a secret drawer. In one letter, dad had written mother that he was surprised and happy to learn that she was saving his letters. He wrote her, who knows, Maybe someday they will become a diary of all this. Likewise, my father's diaries were hidden away and only found by a miracle, as I said before. And then last year, Fred and I happened to meet and over a beer came to realize what our dads had done together almost 80 years ago. We believe these stories have only been discovered and revealed by interventions of mysterious and perhaps spiritual dimension. How else to explain the confluence of events that led Fred and I to meet? Otherwise, the story of this complex current of destiny could never have been assembled. So here, our parents have come together finally to tell you this story. Thank you.
Yes. Was there a name of the airbase that they flew out of there in India that they were flying from? It was Tezpur. Tezpur, but the more common bases were Sukarating and Chabua. And so that was another thing that we thought was remarkable because the history books don't ever mention Tezpur, and that's where our, both our fathers were. Your dad was C 47s, so we would guess it would be Chabua. But we'll find out. If I, if I heard it correctly, it was 6,000 pounds per C 87 being transported. So, what does that equate in terms of what percent of fueling a B 29? Oh, I'm sorry, the C-109, which had welded-in fuel tanks, uh, carried 6,000 gallons total, including its wing tanks. Okay. Does that represent 20% of a B-29 need to fly a mission? Or, or? I have to look at the chart, uh, but what was notable was that they, it took more fuel to fly to China than they had left to deliver. Oh. <laughs> yeah, bear. Fair on. Uh, Alex, Yes. Uh, we know that Fred's dad continued to fly as a, as a career and, uh, vice president of marketing in Cessna. Did your dad continue to fly as a private or a pilot after he did. the war? He did. I think the only thing he loved more than my mother was flying. <laughs> and even that was, you know, um, he loved it. I mean, when, when I was a kid growing up, we flew all over the state uh, campaigning. Uh, he had a private uh, single-engine Bonanza. I'll take that so I don't have to yell. Um, yeah, he, he loved it. When he got MS, uh, I think maybe four or five years in, he was notified that he needed to take some kind of a test in order to keep his license, which he said, phooey. Uh, but they made him take it, and he didn't pass because of all of the new stuff. Uh, and I think maybe that was one of the worst days of his life. He loved to fly. Um, Alex has a story I tried to get of his dad flying the family in a King Air. And it was so badly iced up, he tells about slamming down on the runway in this iced up King Air. Yeah. I had experiences like <laughs> we, that with we my dad. coming back from a vacation and all six of the family were in this plane and it was nighttime. And we'd landed in San Fran in uh, Colorado Springs, and the snow was really coming down. And the five of us were saying, you know, we, we don't think we really want to go all the way to Denver in this, to which Dad again said, phooey, and piled us all back in the plane, and off we went. And it was, I mean, the, everything was iced over. Mom was supposed to be the co-pilot, but pfft, she couldn't see anything, and she was having trouble with the maps. Um, and so Dad was, had just had this look on his face, and that was the look that said, we're going to do this no matter what anybody else says. And as we were coming down, getting lower and lower, just before the end of the runway, there was a tremendous crack, and I thought we'd hit the snow fence, and we're going to, you know, go up in flames. Turns out it was the ice, as Fred mentioned, it was the ice breaking off of the wings of, off the ailerons when we hit the ground. That must have seemed pretty tame compared to flying up. <laughs> I, I wouldn't know and I'm glad that I don't. <laughs> I just wanted to mention I have my daughter, Elon, the granddaughter of Frank Martin, and my two grandkids. Cora and James. So we have great grandkids for the story. And uh, I just want to point, we have Rosie the Riveter with us. If you have not seen Rosie the Riveter, you must come see her. Okay, as long as we're doing that, I would like to introduce my brother Michael, who is a Vietnam vet right here. And the light of my life, my lovely wife, Denise. Well, Alex oh and Fred, oh thank you so much for uh, being our thank speaker and sharing you. your story with us. It is very inspirational. Thank you. And please visit some more and also go upstairs and see our new exhibit 
which is about flying the hump. So thank you very much. We'll see you Monday, hopefully.